Hi students, welcome to the chapter seven lecture over bone tissue. Um, this is with support from the Saladin textbook, um, eighth edition. Um, I like to tell my students with this slide, um, I have some animal skulls in my natural history collection, and I used to have a dermestid beetle colony. Um, and it might be of some comfort to know that I don't actually have a human skull in my collection, but I do like to um, bring some actual examples of skulls to class just so students can get a feel for what real bone tissue looks and feels like. Uh, of course, we have some really nice models of human bones and a full articulated skeleton in the classroom, but we don't have access to real human bones, so it's always interesting to be able to see uh, the texture and just the intricate structures, um, particularly like the nasal turbinate bones um, within animal skulls, just to get a better idea of the fact that, you know, bone is a really dynamic tissue. Um, you're going to see individual differences between specimens. You're going to be able to see uh, nutrient foramen, uh, foramina, and other features that aren't necessarily well represented in models. So in this lecture, I am going to be covering some gross anatomy of bones, microscopic anatomy of bones, and then we'll be talking about some physiological topics as well. Okay, so tissues and organs of the skeletal system. This is gonna be a nice precursor to um, the following chapter, which is gonna be gross anatomy of the skeleton. So the skeletal system is composed of bones, cartilages, and ligaments. Um, cartilage, recall from our studies of histology, is a connective tissue. And as a connective tissue, there's generally more space occupied by the extracellular matrix than there are by the actual chondrocytes or cartilage cells. And cartilage actually serves as the forerunner of most of our bones. So during fetal development and childhood growth, um, we have hyaline cartilage models that are eventually infiltrated by osteoid tissue. And that osteoid tissue is what uses those cartilage models to form our mature bone tissue. Cartilage also covers many of the joint surfaces in mature bone. Um, it's a Again, it's a connective tissue, so it is going to be uh, serving a very important purpose in terms of reducing friction at joints and providing a better gliding surface for bone-to-bone -bone contact. Uh, we also have ligaments. These are uh, what hold bones together at joints. And we have tendons, which attach muscle to bone. And I like to tell students one of the ways that you can remember the difference between tendons and ligaments is tendons attach muscle to bone. Muscle is a more tender structure than bone is. So tendons attach muscle to bone, whereas ligaments attach bone to bone. Okay, let's talk about some functions of the skeleton. Uh, some of these are a little bit more intuitive than others. You'll probably be pretty familiar with the fact that um, a lot of our skeleton serves for support, protection, and movement. So with support, we have our limb bones and the vertebrae that support our body. Uh, we have the jaw bones, the mandibles, that support our teeth. And recall that teeth are not actually bone. They are a separate type of tissue. They're a connective tissue, uh, which are treated as part of the digestive system. And then we also have some bones that support viscera. Viscera is another term for internal organs. So a great example of that would be the skull. The cranial bones physically support the brain, for example. Uh, the thoracic cage, the ribs, and the sternum will help to support the lungs and heart. Uh, protection. Nowhere is it more apparent that bones serve a protective function than with our cranial bones because they are protecting our brain. Uh, spinal cord, the spaces between our vertebrae is uh, where our spinal cord is. Uh, 
also um, heart and lungs within the thoracic cage, protected again by our sternum, our ribs, and also the vertebrae. Um, movement, our long bones are gonna serve very important functions for supporting skeletal muscles. They're gonna act as the levers um, through which skeletal muscle contraction uh, helps to move our body. Breathing, uh, we can basically use our thoracic cage to influence the volume of, of um, space available for us to breathe in. Now these last three are functions that you might not necessarily think about when you're considering the functions of the skeleton. Um, electrolyte balance, calcium and phosphate levels. We actually have um, a reservoir of calcium that is freely exchangeable with our blood. And I'll be talking more about that when I talk about calcium homeostasis. Um, whenever we break down bone tissue, we can also release phosphate and that can be used elsewhere in the body. Um, acid base balance, our skeleton will help to buffer blood against large pH changes by altering phosphate and carbonate salt levels. And again, that largely has to do with um, breakdown of bone tissue. Uh, blood formation, we have red bone marrow being the chief producer of blood cells. Um, so recall that red blood cells or erythrocytes do not undergo mitosis. So erythrocytes are red blood cells. Those are actually produced within our red bone marrow. And as adults, there are several uh, locations where red bone marrow is located, like the head of the humerus and the head of the femur. Um, and in infants, pretty much all of the marrow cavities will uh, be red bone marrow. So red bone marrow is gonna be the chief producer of blood cells. So when we talk about bones, another term for this is osseous tissue. So osseous tissue is the same thing as bone tissue. It can be defined as a connective tissue with the matrix hardened by calcium, phosphate, and other minerals. So remember that all connective tissues, what they have in common, they'll have various cell types. Let's just say this is a generic cell within connective tissue, but then they'll also have fibers. They'll have reticular or elastic fibers or other ground substance. And the extracellular material actually makes up more space than the cells themselves. So if you're looking at a slide of connective tissue, you will tend to see cells, but they'll be widely spaced and there will just be this ground substance um, or matrix between those cells. So in the case of osseous tissue, we have bone cells known as osteoblasts that produce organic fibers such as collagen and through the process of calcification, you have calcium and phosphate salts diffusing into these tissue areas from the bloodstream and actually turning that into hardened bone material. So bone can be defined as a connective tissue with the matrix hardened by calcium, phosphate, and other minerals. And I'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end of this lecture, but mineralization or calcification is simply, simply the hardening process of bone. So that's how we go from having bone cells with collagen and other organic uh, material within the ground substance to having this hard ossified tissue that forms uh, the, su the support for our body. And you really can think of bones as organs. You know, when you think of organ, you're probably thinking heart, stomach, lungs, etc but because there are multiple tissue types that comprise bones, you can also think of bones as organs. So an individual bone is going to consist of the bone tissue itself, bone marrow, which can be red bone marrow or yellow bone marrow, which is basically just a storage site for adipocytes, um, cartilage, adipose tissue, again, that's related to bone marrow, 
um, nervous tissue and fibrous connective tissue. So you don't really get a good sense just by looking at a, a articulated skeleton or, or model of the fact that bone really is a dynamic living tissue. There's various cell types within bone. Um, bone tissue can be built up depending on demands that are placed on the skeletal system. Uh, bone tissue can be broken down, particularly if we have, say, hypocalcemia, low calcium levels in the blood. Um, so it is a very dynamic tissue. Let's talk briefly about the classification of bones. And this is something that will come into play a little bit more when we discuss gross anatomy of the skeleton. Um, but just as an introduction, uh, flat bones, these are going to be thin curved plates and they generally help protect soft organs. A great example of this would be the individual bones of the cranium. So for example, the frontal bone, the parietal bones, the occipital bone, all of those form our skull and those help to protect the brain. Uh, long bones are just going to be longer than they are wide. So these are, for example, the bones of the appendages, uh, the upper and lower limbs, the humerus in the arm, the radius and ulna in the forearm, femur in the thigh, fibula and tibia in the legs, for example. So these are going to be rigid levers that are acted upon by muscles, and of course they are crucial for movement. Then we have short bones, which are approximately equal in length and width. A um, good example of this would be the carpal bones of the hand, so they glide across one another in multiple directions. And then finally, irregular bones. Uh, these are bones that don't really fit into other categories because the shape is fairly irregular. So things like the vertebrae and uh, the patella, commonly referred to as the kneecap, um, those are going to be irregular bones. Okay, so a lot of the rest of this lecture is kind of going to be looking at the small scale structure, small scale anatomy of both compact and spongy bone. So compact bone is the dense outer shell of bone. If you're just looking at a whole bone that hasn't been cut or sectioned in any way, what you're seeing is compact bone. You look at an articulated skeleton, everything that you see there is going to be your compact bone. The spongy bone is also known as cancellous bone, and another term for that would be trabecular bone. Um, so this bone is loosely organized bone tissue that's found in the center of ends and shafts of long bones and in the middle of nearly all other bones. And always with the spongy bone, that's going to be covered by more durable compact bone. So again, if you're just looking at an entire bone or an articulated skeleton, what you're seeing on the outside is that compact bone. That's also what we looked at with our histology slides. What basically looks like, I kind of like to describe it as tree rings, these individual structural units that make up compact bone are called osteons. It's kind of a horrible drawing. Um, but that very characteristic compact bone uh, structure. So by weight, the entire skeleton is about three quarters compact bone and one quarter spongy bone. Again, this is by weight, and it makes sense that spongy bone is going to be just a quarter of the skeleton's weight because spongy bone literally looks like a sponge. It will have what are known as trabeculae, little beams, and then it will just have empty space. And I apologize, this doesn't really look like anything special, but all of this, this black would be spaces and then these would be little trabeculae within that spongy bone. So a lot of the spongy bone is essentially just empty space. And you're, you're going to find um, red bone marrow in some cases and yellow bone marrow in other cases. Okay, so let's look at a typical long bone here. Um, 
we'll get to some of this other terminology momentarily, uh, but just so you have an idea of the general anatomy of a bone here, we have the compact bone on the outside. This blue represents what's known as articular cartilage, which helps to reduce friction at joints. Spongy bone is going to be found in what's known as the epiphysis, the enlarged end of this long bone. And then we have this marrow space in the middle. So we have yellow bone marrow in this case. That's just adipocytes, adipose tissue. And then if we were to zoom in on a little cross section of this spongy bone, um, you would see that there are a lot of spaces. So these are the trabeculae, these little beams. And then all of these empty spaces basically reduces the weight of the skeleton while allowing for infiltration of blood vessels, for example. And then your compact bone is gonna be on the outside. Let's talk about some general features of bones. Um, articular cartilage, which I just mentioned, is going to be a layer of hyaline cartilage that covers the joint surface and allows joints to move more freely. A joint, of course, is anywhere you have multiple bone, bones coming together. So, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a synovial joint like uh, elbow or knee or shoulder. Anywhere where two bones come together is technically considered a joint. Um, even the cranial bones um, where they come together. Um, you might find varying amounts of cartilage or little to no cartilage in, in certain joints, but in general, for joints that have a lot of movement, you're gonna see hyaline cartilage there. So it's going to allow the joint to move more freely. Um, this is an example of hyaline cartilage, and this is pretty accurate. So the appearance of the hyaline cartilage or the articular cartilage is going to be this bright, glossy white. And uh, again, that's basically gonna help to reduce friction at joints. And then we also have nutrient foramina a foramen, so the singular version of foramina is just foramen, all that is is a hole. So in this case, it's a hole that goes through bone tissue, a minute hole that allows blood vessels to penetrate, and foramina do not necessarily have to be nutrient foramina. They can also allow for nerves to pass through spaces in bone tissue, for example. So if you look at the back of the orbit, the eye socket within the cranium for, uh, as an example, you'll see the foramen that will allow the optic nerve to pass from the eyeball to the brain. So that would be another example of a foramen. It doesn't necessarily have to be strictly for uh, blood vessels. Another feature that we see in bones is what's known as the periosteum. Peri basically means around. So around our bones, we're gonna have this external sheath consisting of an outer fibrous layer of collagen. This is a type of protein. Um, some, some of those protein fibers are actually continuous with tendons. And remember, what do tendons connect bones to? They connect bone to muscle. And then perforating fibers, or Sharpie's fibers, they are actually going to penetrate into the bone matrix and allow for more connectivity uh, between connective tissues um, and, and bone tissue. Then we also have the inner osteogenic layer of bone forming cells. Osteo just refers to bone, genic, think genesis, creation, osteogenic, bone forming cells. So these are going to be important to bone growth as well as healing of fractures. So that is the periosteum. We have the outer fibrous layer and then the inner osteogenic layer. And then the endosteum is comprised of reticular connective tissue that lines the marrow cavity. And it will actually have cells that dissolve osseous tissue and others that deposit it. So there are a couple of specialized uh, cell types that I'll be talking about shortly. Okay, so again, if we were to look at a cross section here, longitudinal section, really, um, 
We have our compact bone on the outside with our osteons. So that's like the little structural unit that makes up our bone, our uh, compact bone. We have the marrow cavity, which in this case is occupied by yellow bone marrow. And the endosteum, it's kind of hard to see. It's basically just that thin layer of reticular connective tissue. And we have uh, bone forming cells and bone resorbing cells in that layer. The periosteum, outer fibrous layer, um, sharpies or perforating fibers that will actually enter uh, the bony matrix here, and then this is just a, a nutrient artery. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about long bones. Remember that long bones are simply bones that are longer than they are wide. Um, can you remember some examples of long bones in the body? For example, we have the humerus. The femur. The tibia. So these are long bones. They have what's known as a diaphysis. That is the shaft that provides leverage. So that's the main length of the bone is called the diaphysis. They will have a medullary cavity, which is another term for marrow cavity. This is the space within the diaphysis that contains bone marrow. And then we have epiphyses, which are enlarged ends of a long bone. And it makes sense why you would see that enlarged end because where bones come together you typically have more stress in those areas and you might have various skeletal muscles attaching or spanning a joint so they really serve to just strengthen a joint they provide more surface area for anchoring ligaments and tendons so diaphysis the shaft of the long bone epiphysis or epiphyses plural would be those enlarged knobby ends of the long bone um, you'll, you'll get an idea of what this looks like um, in the next slide. And then the epiphyseal plate, or the growth plate, this is an area of hyaline cartilage that separates the epiphyses and the diaphyses in children. It's what enables the growth in length. And once your bones have grown to their full length, that growth plate is replaced by what's known as an epiphyseal line. This is just a bony scar that marks where the growth plate used to be. So x-ray of a child's hand here. We have the diaphysis. We have the enlarged knobby end known as the epiphysis. And then these spaces are our epiphyseal plates. So you'll kind of see these interruptions between the diaphysis and the epiphyses, and it's very apparent down here, this is going to be your zone of growth. So it's that area of hyaline cartilage, and it serves to lengthen bones. And those, are, those uh, growth plates are essentially going to disappear and become non-functional once those bones reach their um, adult length. But at that point, you'll just see basically a faint line it won't be as obvious as the epiphyseal plate, but you'll see a faint line that kind of interrupts the diaphysis from the epiphysis, and that's where the epiphyseal plate used to be. So for red bone marrow, this is also known as hematopoietic tissue. In adults, we have a few limited areas where you'll find the production of uh, erythrocytes trabecular cavities of the heads of the femur and humerus. So the femur colloquial term would be the thigh bone. Humerus would be the bone of the arm. So trabecular cavities, remember trabecular is just another term for spongy bone. Trabecular cavities of the heads of those bones and also the trabecular cavities of the diploe of flat bones. So the diploe is basically just the spongy bone between the compact bone 
within flat bones. So the clavicles and the bones of the skull. That's just a specific term for that area. Now in newborn infants, you're going to see red marrow in basically all spongy bone. So the medullary cavities and all spaces within spongy bone. So let's review some of the general features of bones. We have the diaphysis here, which is the main part of the bone. Pen kind of went wild there. Um, the epiphyses, which are these enlarged knobby ends. So this would be the head of the femur. That's what fits into what's known as the acetabulum of the pelvic girdle and forms that ball and, and socket joint of the hip. Um, this would also be an epiphysis down here. It's just an enlarged knobby end. Um, here's the epiphyseal line. So this is a, a bone from an adult. You don't actually see active growth in length here, but there's still this little line that interrupts the diaphysis and the epiphysis and shows you where the epiphyseal plate used to be. The compact bone is what you see on the outside. The spongy bone is what you see in the epiphyses and in parts of the medullary cavities. The marrow cavity itself is the empty, it's not actually empty space, it's, it's a space where you're going to see um, marrow filling the bone. Um, articular cartilage is going to be the specialized hyaline cartilage here that helps to reduce friction and provides for a gliding movement at joints. And then the periosteum is just the very outer layer surrounding the bone. Let's talk a little bit more about flat bones. Flat bones are going to be, uh, for example, the cranial bones. They have a sandwich-like construction. So if you were to imagine, if you were to zoom in on this little section of skull here, the bread of the sandwich would be the compact bone. And then what you put in your sandwich is the spongy bone. In this case, it's called diploe. So it's just a special term for the spongy bone within, within the flat bones. So two layers of compact bone enclosing a middle layer of spongy bone. Both of these surfaces are gonna be covered by periosteum. So remember, periosteum is going to be um, fibrous tissue on the outer areas of the bones. Uh, the diploe, spongy middle layer, and this design really provides for a combination of strength, resiliency, and lightweight. So, you know, if we had compact bone for the entire um, space here, our skulls would weigh a lot more, and they also wouldn't necessarily be stronger. You might think that having this solid material would make our cranial bones stronger, but having these little trabecular, these little struts and beams here actually helps to absorb shock. And then those uh, empty spaces between those trabeculae help to reduce weight. Let's talk a little bit about bone cells. So in the beginning of this lecture, I introduced the fact that, you know, connective tissue, what it has in common is you're going to have some specialized cell types, and then you're also going to have the extracellular space occupied by various types of protein. And then in the case of bone, you have those protein fibers attracting calcium salts and phosphate salts, and you eventually get this calcified hard material that forms our, our bone. So the cell types that are actually functioning within this tissue, there are four principal types. We have osteogenic cells, osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about each one of these. So osteogenic, just looking at that word, what do you think that means? Osteo always is going to refer to bone. Genic refers to creation or generation. So creation of bone. 
you get a good idea of what osteogenic cells do just by looking at what they're called. So an osteogenic cell is going to be able to differentiate into the cell type known as an osteoblast. And I like to tell my students, how can we remember this? An osteoblast blasts out proteins. So you have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum in this cell. They are going to be exporting a lot of proteins into this extracellular space. And once an osteoblast has surrounded itself with this ground substance, once it is basically trapped within this matrix, it becomes an osteocyte. And site, remember, just means cell. So we have our osteogenic cells. They will give rise to osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are really the bone forming cells. They're gonna be producing all of this protein. Um, eventually, you're going to have calcification of that matrix and an osteoblast that has been trapped and surrounded by this matrix is known as an osteocyte. That's a mature bone cell. And then also we have an osteoclast. So an osteoclast is actually a bone resorbing cell. And one of the interesting features about these bone resorbing cells is this area known as a ruffled border. If you think back to our overview of basic cell biology when we were talking about microvilli and cilia, you might recall that having those little extensions of the cell surface increases surface area. And an osteoclast is going to be coming into contact with bone tissue and the more surface area it has, the faster and more efficiently it can break down that bone tissue. So again, we have our osteogenic cell. That's going to give rise to our osteoblast. It's going to differentiate into an osteoblast because it's essentially a stem cell. It, it functions very, uh, very much similarly to the stem cells that give rise to osteoclasts. And then once that osteoblast is trapped by the matrix, it becomes an osteocyte. With osteoclasts, we do have a, a different process. We have a different type of cell. It's just a, a stem cell that will undergo uh, development. And you'll notice within this mature osteoclast, you have multiple nuclei. That's because multiple stem cells will actually fuse together and form one large osteoclast cell. So an osteoclast cell kind of has this appearance of one of those antique combs that women would put in their hair for decoration and to help keep their hair up. Um, but an, osteo, um, an osteoclast is going to have this resorption bay and it's going to uh, secrete chemicals that will actually break down bone tissue. Now, why would we wanna break down bone tissue? That's something that you might wanna be thinking about, and I'll be discussing that briefly as well. So when we look at the matrix of osseous tissue, everything that's actually outside of the osteocytes, by dry weight, about a third is organic material, things such as proteins and two thirds is inorganic. So calcium and phosphorus, for example. The organic matter is going to be synthesized by those osteoblasts. Remember those osteoblasts blasting out proteins. Um, it's gonna be collagen and protein carbohydrate complexes. The inorganic matter, about 85% hydroxyapatite, which is crystallized calcium phosphate salts. About 10% calcium carbonate, and then the rest is other minerals, such as fluoride, potassium, and magnesium. So this combination really provides for strength and resilience. The minerals help to resist compression, but the collagen really helps to resist tension. And bones will adapt by varying proportions depending on, on what stresses are placed on those bones. 
Let's talk about the microscopic anatomy of compact bone as well as spongy bone. So with compact bone, we have what's known as the haversion system or osteon. So the osteon is gonna be the structural unit. We have lamellae, which are weight-bearing column-like matrix tubes. And then the central or haversion canal, which contains blood vessels and nerves. So if we look at a section of bone here, you'll see these, the classic color coding here. Um, veins carry blood to the heart, arteries carry blood away from the heart. Arteries are typically depicted as red, veins are typically depicted as blue, and then we'll also have nerves. So those are going to be the vessels and nerves that travel through the central or haversion canal. And then basically these column-like tubes are the lamellae. Now, if we were to look at just an osteon, which is the structural unit of compact bone, there's a few terms that you might wanna be familiar with. The central canal, which again is the space where we have our blood vessels and our nerve supply. The lamellae, which are basically the concentric rings. Uh, canaliculi, which are, they basically look like little hairline fractures, but they'll connect the spaces that hold the bone cells to one another and to the central canal. And those spaces that actually hold the osteocytes are, are known as lacunae. So within the lacunae, you'll see the osteocytes. And then if we were to look at the lamellae, again, these are basically the concentric rings. So these look like tree rings in a section of compact bone. And then in the middle, again, you're gonna see the structures within the central canal, the artery with capillaries, the vein and the nerve fiber. And notice that within these lamellae, you also have collagen fibers that will run in different directions, which helps to resist various forces that are placed on the bones. Uh, there are also Volkmann's or perforating canals that are found at right angles to the central canal. Those will connect blood vessels and nerves of the periosteum and the central canal. The lacunae, as I mentioned, are just the small cavities that will contain osteocytes mature bone cells. And then the canaliculi, the hair-like canals that connect lacunae to each other and to the central canal. Now with spongy bone, spongy bone doesn't actually contain osteons. So you don't see this functional structural unit that has this predictable pattern with spongy bone. You have trabeculae, which is still bone tissue. Uh, it's just not organized into osteons. So trabeculae align along lines of stress. Uh, they're, they are going to contain irregularly arranged lamellae, osteocytes, and canaliculi. And you'll also see capillaries within the endosteum that supply nutrients. Capillaries are smallest blood vessels. So they basically diffuse throughout well, they, they are perfused within all of our tissues. Um, they're very extensive network, and these are what supply our tissues with oxygen and nutrients and provide for waste removal. So just looking at spongy bone, again, you're, you're not going to see osteons. You're going to see kind of irregular arrangement of um, osteocytes and lamellae, they're not going to have this tight structural unit like you see in compact bone. 